Uh, we do have a lot of panelists up here. We also have a good audience, and I want to make this interactive because we're after lunch. The biggest challenge as of today is funding. Great. Uh, thanks, Will. Thanks, Anand. Uh, I'm Shiva Devreddy, founder of GoCorp. Uh, GoCorp is the first uh, social marketplace for weavers and artisans in India. Uh, friends, as you know, there are more than uh, 9 million uh, weavers and artisans in India. Uh, most of them don't even make uh, basic minimum wage. Uh, while the same products are being sold in Western markets and European markets. Uh, today we are at uh, 35 clusters in India across six states. Uh, uh, in India has uh, more than 1,000 clusters. So uh, we have challenges in terms of growth, both on the supply side. Uh, we are ambitious in terms of reaching out to more than 100 clusters. And on the buy side, uh, we need to see how we can work with a large number of buyers, international buyers, and bring business to these artisans in India. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'll start with a small question. How many of you think garbage or waste is a crisis in India? Oh, I love it when the, most of the audience is from Bangalore or Bombay. It's, <laughs> most of the hands go up. Nice. I'm, I come from Hyderabad. Uh, I, I'm Roshan Miranda representing Waste Ventures India. Uh, we work on management of waste. The core idea here is to avert dumping of waste, almost 90% of the waste being dumped into dump sites. Now, we work mostly with bulk producers of waste, who produce almost 40% of urban waste. Uh, these are housing societies, academic institutions, big corporate campuses, uh, manufacturing plants, and so on. And we provide them a total waste management solution. It could be organic waste, which is wet waste uh, in common terms, or recyclable waste. Uh, when, I mean, we do this in an inclusive manner. We also work, one of the bulk producers we work with, although they are one step removed uh, from the actual producer, is waste pickers. We work with them extensively uh, to enhance their livelihood as well, and I'm happy to talk about it in, um, in, in detail. But, I mean, going back to uh, what are our challenges, I think it also um, addresses where we are headed. Uh, today, waste management is completely government supported and grafted in. We want to take that and build a model that is self sustaining. And what is our challenge? One of the major challenges that we face is policy and advocacy. Today, a contractor is paid on a per ton basis for him to take the waste from the producer space and go and dump it in the dump sites. It's a perverse incentive. This guy will never allow for any management to happen. We want that system to change, and we want an active, proactive involvement from the government to bring in, po bring in policies which not only address the base uh, situation, but also bring in a lot of entrepreneurs like me and the entrepreneurs who we want to encourage and, and be in this space. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I'm Ram. I'm from Fora Recycling. We do three things. Uh, one, which uh, currently Roshan is not handling. We handle electrical and electronic waste of all kinds. But our simple definition is that if it's got a plug, if it runs on batteries, and if your device has a wheelie bin logo crossed out, it's to be responsibly recycled. And we do that. We've been here for about four years. And uh, over the last uh, two and a half years since we have established our facility, we do three things. We are authorized Microsoft refurbisher, so which means that we provide licenses to refurbish systems across the country. Uh, and uh, we do end-to-end -end recycling, which means we do dismantling, segregation, granulation, stripping, all the way up to working on chemistries for metal extraction. And the third part is that our social intervention, where we work not with rap pickers, but slightly above the next level of the Gabadiolas, but in a slightly different way than what people are doing right now. We are not choosing. We are not choosers there that we pick only electric waste or electronic waste from them. We pick everything. We're kind of veering them away from the informal sector supply chain towards the formal chain. And that, that comes the problem. Our challenges are two in this. One is we believe that when we, and by the way, India has got the highest recycling rate in the world. We recycle everything. I mean, we are probably one of the highest recyclers in the world. We recycle starting from small papers to plastics to all the way right up the value chain. Because I keep repeating to people whenever people ask me, we can compete with businesses. We can't compete with livelihood. We heard we are actually speaking, whenever we any management, waste management set up, for us get set up, we are actually kind of trying to get into somebody's livelihood. As long as actually they are part of the, we believe that they're part of the solution, we can't do anything. Our fundamental belief is that we are able to turn them around from just being in the informal sector to the formal sector by changing the way they behave. And ultimately, my challenge is to, one, to all of us to believe there is responsible recycling around. So when you recycle stuff, ensure that actually it's responsibly recycled, not just given away to a rat picker or a And 
on obviously scale and growth, but that's a different problem we can talk about. Hi, uh, I'm Mihir, Mihir Shah, uh, UV Life Sciences. What excites me the most is to be able to leverage technology to address our health disparity. And the area that I chose uh, was cancer, and in particularly breast cancer. Uh, we'll discuss more about us a little, little later. Thank you, Mihir. Hi, I'm Lata Srinivasan uh, from Chipper Side Education. Uh, we help children, to just put it in an action, we help children read and understand English better. Uh, as you all would have known, uh, we have read in the papers that many college graduates often leave uh, their education or with very little or dysfunctional English skills. So this makes them you know, not be able to read or un uh, understand English the way it is expected for, for them to be employable. So we actually go down where they start learning the language. So we deal with children, especially in the tier two, tier three schools, uh, especially which we call the affordable private schools. And we help them right from the way they start the alphabet to decoding, to uh, developing their fluency and finally comprehension. Uh, most of these affordable private schools, they uh, are English medium schools because parents want their children. It's, a, it's an uh, aspirational in India. So we have children who read their all the core subjects like math, science, everything in English. And when the basic comprehension is not there, then they do, there's no meaning in what they read. And when we, it's, it's often come, uh, comes as a shock when we actually deal, we talk to children who are in grade 8 or grade 9 who are almost completing their school education and they can't even read or uh, comprehend what they are even in their own textbooks and we do not know what kind of uh, exams they pass. And uh, with respect to the problems that they face, our problems are more of scale. Uh, we have had schools uh, work, ask us to send our own teachers and that's where we have a challenge because getting local uh, talent which is good in English is not uh, very easy. And uh, we, uh, the way we offer a solution is through technology which is basically for scale. We also say that teachers cannot be replaced in a classroom. So we enable the teacher in the classroom with technology so he or she can take the uh, content forward. And we also assess our impact using assessment methods. Where we have two levels of assessment, baseline and inline, uh, for most schools. And we uh, work primarily with uh, private schools, but we work with government schools through NGOs. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Pavin. I'm representing Aquasafim. Uh, what we do is we manufacture water purification machinery, which delivers clean drinking water for rural communities. A typical 1,000 liter per hour machinery can serve around 1,000 households in a village. The USP of our machinery is that it can be remotely monitored and it is completely automated. Uh, automated means that it doesn't require a one full-time operator to run this machinery. The major problem with uh, rural infrastructure is that, uh, you know, it's about the poor maintenance and, you know, within a few years they go defense. And this is mainly because of uh, a high overhead cost and, uh, and which happens. So what we are trying to do is move a uh, people dependent and uh, uh, water treatment system to use more of technologies which helps in bringing down the cost of operation and thus helps in achieving sustainability faster. Uh, today uh, we are operating around 150 water stores across Karnataka and thus serving around 150,000 people with clean drinking water every day. We are a bootstrapped organization and I think maybe the one of you in this sector uh, who have been able to make profit for the last two years. Uh, the major obstacle which we see in the present model is that uh, it's highly dependent on the purchase cycle of the a partner organization like NGOs where, whereas we see a lot of potential, as uh, a lot of demand and uh, for uh, clean drinking water stores in the village. So we are working on a, uh, on a um, uh, hybrid model where we can directly partner with the uh, panchayat in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you all for those very clear and brief um, introductions, which leaves plenty of time for some audience conversation. I'm gonna ask one question to get the panel warmed up, and then uh, we'll look for a question from the audience next. And I wanna start with a question. We're at a, we're at a development dialogue, and Many people here are from the NGO sector. In fact, I'd like to ask for a show of hands, if you're from the NGO sector, raise your hand. And if you represent uh, government, raise your hand. Not so much. And how about for-profit sector? Wow, nice balance. Okay, so 
Uh, I wanna, that, that's exact, balance is exactly the question I wanna throw out to uh, two or three people to answer here. Not everybody, but the question of how do you think about the balance between profit and impact? This is a hard question for everybody, but I, I, you know, this is a, and your investors care, your employees care, you care. So, um, Rahan, maybe you can start. Sure. Um, in my opinion, I think, so to give a little bit of what we do, uh, when we started a recycling initiative five months, five months ago in Hyderabad, we wanted to go and identify a material that was being dumped in the dump sites that was not recycled, so that we could monetize it and start recycling of it, so, you know, which essentially averts you know, dumping of this material and averts so much so many tons of material being dumped. Plus also monetization helps waste pickers you know, earn that extra income which provides them a better livelihood. Now when we started it, um, it was a challenge, but, but then there were few decisions involved, and I think that's where probably it's, it's, it's apparent to, you know, it's, it's probably required to discuss you know, how the decision making happens. We took this business up, but we knew that until we go to a certain scale, we are not going to be making any profits here. But for every kg of, of uh, Tetra Pak material that we picked up, we were paying five rupees to waste pickers. And mind you, 90% of our collection happens from waste pickers, and we are the only aggregator, so there is no middleman in between which takes away the value from the waste pickers. So we directly deal with the waste pickers and provide them the maximum value that they can get from this material. So now when we started this, it was a dilemma for us to cross because it was taking us multiple months to break even in that business line, but we had to start it because we were, we were impacting the livelihoods of the waste picker. Now, what I feel is it need not be mutually exclusive because I know that at the scale we are growing and at the scale we will attain in the next two months, we will be breaking even in that business, business line. But now, was a few months or few years, you know, how, where do you draw that line? It's probably something that an entrepreneur asks himself. Do I want to be profitable in the next three months or do I want to be profitable in the next three years? Right? And what determines that for me or for any entrepreneur is that do you have a, enough diversification in your business line which can provide you income from other business lines that you have? Uh, for example, is there a cash cow that you can probably tap into? Maybe recycling of some other material um, or finding a partnership with a big company so that you can handle all their uh, paper products. For example, we ended up having a partnership with ITC. Uh, that gave us enough of uh, profits that we could pump into this business line. Hence, we could see that if not in three months, it's okay. If we are attaining that profit in eight months, it's fine because we'll take it up. We have something else providing us income. Good. That balance is, is probably critical. So it's all about striking balance. Dr. Nand, you, you have some thoughts on this yeah, too. So okay. uh, I come, uh, my background is basically in the nonprofit sector. I work with the UN, I work with NGOs. So this is the first time I got into the private sector. Right? I got into the private sector because of a certain amount of frustration I felt working uh, in the NGO sector, right? I, I simply, when we use the word NGO, not governmental, not profit, very difficult to define what are we for. We are not something, we are not something. And then we say for profit. So I feel this line itself in these sectors which are impact, health, education, waste, is completely an artificial line. We all need to be for value organizations. There is no non-profit, for-profit, non-governmental. We need to create non, nothing with the word non in it, it's a negative word. We need for-value organization. The ultimate test for a for-profit, and I am a loss-making company, the ultimate test is the market test. And I have failed till this point. I have created a business model, the business model lines are generating profit, but the overhead that is required is always something that you don't know at what scale you will manage it. But the objective is to create a model which can stand the test of the market. But at the same time, when you ask this question, how do you balance? I think this is inherent in the DNA of the company. We don't need to really make efforts to try and see how to balance. Once it is inherent in the DNA of the company, I am a primary healthcare provider. There is no way that I will not create impact. It is ingrained in the DNA of my company, whether I stay or somebody else runs this company. And therefore, I should continuously focus on how the market is going, how I'm going to answer the test for the market, and keep trying. Great, thank you. Uh, One last comment, comment. yeah. So the first thing in any guy who does a for-profit and social, the first thing is that above the money comes the passion. I mean, we have to have a passion to do something. If the passion is missing, any amount of money is going to go down the drain. If you're here in Hubli, you're representative of that passion already, right? <laughs> I've been part of the Ishmael Foundation, so that's okay. Good, uh, should we have a point? Yeah, uh, just a quick one, Will. Uh, so the, the way I look at it is uh, 
there is a problem and always an opportunity. Like in, in our case, the opportunity is the craft market is huge, right? I mean, global craft market is estimated to be around $300 billion. Even in India, it's around $5, 6000000000 billion, right? Uh, but the problem is that uh, the markets are not equitable. The producer is not even getting minimum wage in most cases. Um, and But the same, the value of the product is there. There is a particular value, there is a particular market that this product goes to. So for social enterprises, the solution that we build should be uh, taking into account the opportunity and the problem. That is what makes a social enterprise. Uh, if you are just trying to build, build a business out of craft, there are hundreds of craft organizations today selling craft products. But I wouldn't call all of them as social enterprises. I mean, it's debatable. But if you are able to solve the, make sure that the producer is getting a fair price, and there is equi e uh, equity in the markets. I think uh, if we can make the markets more equitable, then I think you are solving the problem. Great. So let's uh, go out to the audience here. Do we have, uh, have any questions in the audience? I see a hand on them. Okay. So uh, I'm Samya. I work with an organization called Samunati. Um, we provide agri value chain financing. Um, my question is open to the panel. Ha there has been a lot of talk about impact. And social business, as you know, is diverse. So how are you as an organization measuring impact? Because according to me, reaching a thousand lives is different from impacting a thousand lives. So what metrics would you, you know, use to actually measure impact? So that, that's a great question. Let's hear from people who have not spoken so far. Um, Lata, you want to start? And, and what I heard the question there, the key point is, it's not just breadth or number of impact, but also depth of impact. And how do you think about that? Yeah. So in education, uh, we have a little tricky situation here because education has got a lot of gestation in it, and uh, because we deal with very young children, it's also that that uh, education or whatever the learning that they have is continuous and not discrete at various points in time. Which is why uh, when when we do the measurements as a baseline at the beginning of the academic year, when children do come in. We have a measurement which is based on uh, the grade levels. And towards the end, when we do the measurement, uh, when they come back the following academic year, it is not where they have left off. It is what we call the slide that we do have. But we do have a measurement, which is why we, in, we intend, we, uh, we do tell schools whom we work with that the measurement has to be done even before the children break for the holidays or even before the exams. And But in our industry, it is a problem because most of the time, especially in the second term, when the class bar, you know, are broken up in because of multiple reasons, children do not get the learning which has to be continuous for them to see any impact. So there are, I think it is sector specific, it depends on the age group that we work with. So, But we, uh, we have seen the maximum impact when children come continuously maybe for a month and that's when we are able to move them up to the next level. Great. Okay. Meher, you have a product? Yeah. In our case, it's uh, quite straightforward. The number of people collecting water from our water stores and they pay for the water and people pay for water when they pay, see a value in that thing and you know it, it and efficacy better than what they have so which, which is quite straightforward that the more the number of people collecting water from a water store is the greater you know, the impact which we have made. But, but Pop, let me challenge you, right? So rich people pay for water and that has no impact on their life other than it makes them not thirsty. Right? But your your customers are different, right? They're not getting poisoned when they drink your water. Yes. So there's a little different thinking about the measurement there. Yeah, if you see our plants are in the, the rural areas and, and it's not in the urban areas and and we do uh, other met metrics of you know what's the percentage of uh, people in the village collecting water. Is it 10% or 30% of the water? And, and who are these people who are collecting water? Yeah, so if you're converting people from being drinkers of uh, mineral contaminated water to clean water, okay then in, on a percentage basis, that's truly a measure of impact in, in that village. Yeah. Even more so the number of uh, leaders that you sell. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Mihir, you have a comment on impact? Ours is a, a bit hard to track, but a very clear metric for what would count as impact, which is the number of life years saved due to an early detection of breast cancer of an underprivileged woman. So I, I could provide a private service with Metropolis or SRL for an affording woman. And that, that goes towards impact too, but it's not pure impact. Pure impact would be a woman who was not going to get a breast exam ever in her lifetime, who we touched upon, 
and that's first level impact. We identified some of them with an early stage of breast cancer. And then they were operated, they were offered the treatment, and the outcomes were that they survived. And their survival would be longer because we know that they were detected at an early stage, and so we can then take a measurement on life here is safe, which is pure impact. That's a great so, example. Hard to track, but we know exactly what impact means. And, and, and just to add a little philosophy to it, I, I have a very simple statement. If it can be done in a for-profit model, it must be done that way. Because if you want to maximize impact, as long as it's done with a conscience and, and with uh, you know, some view of society and sustainability involved, if you can do it for profit, you must do it that way if you truly want to maximize the impact on, on the population uh, on a local, national, or global basis. Well, somebody had said at Davos uh, from Mumbai, there was a live telecast uh, to Davos, and this guy said, and I'm quoting, he said, there's enterprise and there's anti-social enterprise. There is there is nothing like social enterprise because that's built into the definition of an enterprise. You have to be socially aware. Well, Some of us are more inclined that, that, that than the United States uh, financial services companies were anti-social enterprise in 2008. But uh. okay, uh, both of us deal in plastics, of different kinds. Uh, plastic, by definition, is obviously recyclable. It also kind of goes back to the end, and Roshan can add to this, but it actually leads back to us as consumers as to how do we deal with it. I mean, there is one particular slogan, if you go to the Pollution Control Board office, there are two slogans there and two kind of things there, right? And in, in, I've seen it in Bangalore. There is a plastic association which says, save trees, use plastic. There's another banner right next to it, there's an environment guy that says, this, use less plastic, save trees. Now, both are in the same office right next to each other and I have a photograph of it. Now, the thing here is that how responsible are we towards these two items? Now, having said that, there are recycling organizations and recycling enterprises who are trying to do this, but it all comes back to us actually as to how we dispose of them. Now, if we actually kind of give it, dump it to the garbage, it goes to rack pickers and it and ends up in all probabilities with the informal way of doing things of burning and everything else, some of it lands up with erosion. The same thing happens in electrical and electronics. If you give it to the Kabariwala without ensuring that he in turn works with a formal enterprise, it'll again go to the informal sector where they'll burn it. Now it's all a question coming back to us actually as to how we are dealing with it as a consumer, not exactly as that what an enterprise does it with it when you actually get it. Our biggest challenge when for a question that I didn't answer earlier is our supply chain. And and if you see the inverted pyramid of waste generators, we at the bottom of the pyramid are the largest generators. Maybe the Infosys and IBMs around the world, they generate tons and tons of electronic waste. But if you were to kind of assume that guy works in Infosys office and has got two computers at home, He's a larger waste generator than a unit measurement than anyone else. So we are the highest waste generators here. And how we treat our waste is kind of, will translate us to how it gets recycled at the other end. So, so I have a question I want to ask, because I saw the audience is half for profit, and we established that you guys are all for profit up here. But uh, I know that some of you employ some unique business models that involve using hybrid Nonprofit and for profit action, N NGO and for profit. And we can take the non out of there, but it's just the way it is uh, for now. Uh, so, uh, maybe, Mihir, could you talk about how you've uh, coupled these two to, to uh, maximize your ability to uh, grow the business and have impact using a combination of donation capital and for profit capital together? Right. So, our customers uh, are of very, very nature. Some of them want to induce early detection in the society or some part of the community. And some of them want to provide a service in that part of the society. And we do that by a couple different ways. One is that if, if a foundation or an NGO or a CSR fund wants to cause early detection to happen in a certain region or community, we work through our NGO partnerships and we are in the process of forming our own NGO, uh, which will provide a service uh, by purchasing machinery and training from the for-profit company. So the, the transaction involves us and we are part of the economic equation, but we make sure that their end goals are preserved as they're making this philanthropic investment. On the other side, when we partner with uh, Metropolis or SRL or Diagnostics Change for Hospitals who wants to provide a for-profit service, they directly transact with us like any, anywhere else and we provide a service or a product. So we have a, a combination way of dealing with 
all sorts of customers between these two, right from the government and, and all the so social service bodies in, in between to the profit generating customers. Great. Lata, I think you said you employ some similar uh, tactics. Can you talk about it? Yeah. So we have only one kind of customer, which is every, every customer base. It's only the quantum of the money that is getting paid that only differs. So when we work with schools, schools pay us per child. So that's a very, very dominant amount. But we also work with NGOs who in turn work with the underprivileged group, who in turn work with the government schools. And those, the beneficiaries do not pay, but the NGO pays us. And in the similar way, we also have worked with CSRs of organizations through their foundations, where again, they pay us when we actually work with children. Actually out fundraising right now, raising a $50 million fund, uh, half in India, half overseas. And they want to say, how, you know, where are the exits going to come from? How are we going to give a return to our investors? And ultimately, that means anybody I've invested in, and we've invested in three of the companies here, has to be able to achieve follow-on growth capital rounds. Um, and we actually typically reinvest, as many other early stage investors do. So we'll, you know, we, we're in the seed series. Somebody else uh, comes on for A. We'll then contribute to A. Somebody comes on for B. We'll either contribute to B, or we'll maybe sell some of our shares, or even all of our shares, on that third round of funding. And maybe on the fourth round of funding, we would sell all of our shares. Um, that would be a typical model uh, in the uh, venture funding progression. Now, also, other things that happen, we have one company uh, where a uh, global strategic investor is interested in buying all of the company now, even soon after a seed round. Um, and we're considering whether we would sell all of our shares to this uh, global st strategic. Uh, but those are all, in many cases, uh, not easy to come by. Uh, we've had one partial exit, we've got a couple more coming along. Um, other impact funds have had a number of exits, and many of them come from uh, private equity investors that buy the entire company and then grow it and then resell it again later. So that's the, what you'd see is, is secondary sales to other financial investors or sales in the entirety to a strategic investor, buyer, or a private equity company. That's where exits come. All that said, that's in the world of venture. And there's another form of financing which does not get used enough, um, which is called revenue or royalty-based financing. It's hard for us to do as international investors because you're not allowed to bring debt into this country, or easily, you can, but it's very expensive. Um, but there's many, uh, many other markets where debt-based funding, uh, where the debt gets paid back as a percentage of revenue, so it's basically a self-liquidating investment. That's, in fact, a very good form of investing in impact companies that may not have the benefit of a private equity investor or a follow-on uh, financial investor to, to take the, uh, create the liquidity for the, the original investors. So it, it is, it's in fact a, probably the most important question to ask uh, in any investment scenario, which is how are you going to get your money back for your investors? And it gets asked both of the portfolio CEOs that we have, but also of ourselves as, uh, as investors and uh, fiduciaries of our limited partners money. Thank you for that question. Other questions for our panelists here? Down, down in the front please. Oh, here we go. Mike. We're on here. So, so I, I urge you women to get your thinking caps on and go with the question. I also have a female colleague and I can whisper in her ear for her to ask. If that's uh, I'm actually smart to do that on her own, but go ahead. <laughs> um, I, uh, I have a question about impact and it, it may be slightly nuanced on the, the first question. But it's, it's about measurement versus uh, attribution. So uh, how do we measure things is, is a lot to do with outcome often, um, but how do we actually attribute changes in a social system to some global or complex metric to the work that we're doing? And I'm, I'm curious if, if any of you would like to share some of the challenges that you've had or successes uh, with attributing the work that you're doing uh, to the changes within the, the metrics that many organizations are hoping to, to move. Raise your hand. We, we do. One, uh, wow, okay. Then we've got some work to do, uh, for those of us in the for-profit world. I, I, I should publish your impact. I can publish yours. I can publish yours. <laughs> okay, so talk about attribution. Uh, how, how can you uh, take, uh, what I'm hearing is how, how do you take credit for the ultimate uh, impact that's, uh, that's claimed? Inherently changing the standard of diagnosis or standard of care 
and by getting several other stakeholders to think about early detection of breast cancer, maybe not necessarily through our technology, through our equipment, but actually take it up, uh, would be a way to attribute towards the overall goal. Uh, the other goal is uh, survival. So you attribute uh, impact towards survival. And so that's why I said the quality of the number of life you're saved is actually an attribute, uh, attributed factor towards uh, how meaningful the impact was. Uh, it, for us in a developing country and world environment, it sometimes gets difficult as we are learning because epidemiology is not measured really well. Uh, without us doing anything so far, India doesn't really know what its uh, per capita uh, you know, incidence rate of any given cancer is. They have a number of registries and they try and draw a parallel for the whole country based on those registries. So one of the things that we want to do is actually not only detect the cancer, but also create a live mobile registry of cancer. And this is the other thing that we are picking up as we move forward, and actually our for-profit investors, our venture capital investors are pretty excited about that fact. So it was interesting to see that what made us think about this was impact-driven um, metrics that United started asking us about, and we thought of this mobile cancer registry, and then when we discussed it with our potential investor, they said, they, that sounds like an awesome idea. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, Shiva, you talk about uh, trying to have fair wages go to your supply chain. But um, can you attribute the work that you're doing to actually truly increasing the, wa the wages and livelihoods? I mean, how do you actually follow that line all the way through? Yeah, uh, good point, uh, Will. It's actually quite difficult to, um, to have the complete transparency in the supply chain. Uh, and that's where I think the model is very important. Uh, so we usually work with uh, uh, smaller cooperatives where we can actually also ask them uh, what is the wage that they are actually paying uh, to the particular weaver who is working on our order. So the costing sheets that we develop actually have a wage component and then we can actually look at the wage that they are usually getting paid versus the wage that they would get paid if they are working on our order. Uh, so we can attribute uh, the increase in wage uh, directly to the orders that we give. Um, and I think, yeah, that's one of the important things yeah, Thank that you. we want to do. This question is for me here. I'm Samitha. Uh, we have a software company. We develop software for gynecologists, which connects gynecologists to the women in India. Uh, this question is based on uh, the breast cancer. Uh, what we have uh, realized in our study is that uh, breast, breast cancer uh, has been uh, kind of I mean, in developed countries, people are getting more and more aware, and mammograms or pap smears, which are helping with cervical cancer, awareness <coughs> is much more. Compared to what we have in India, um, I don't think uh, when people go to a gynecologist or even for a regular doctor, a doctor is checking regularly with the patient whether you have done your mammogram, when was the last time you did it, or when did the last time you did a pap smear. So I want to understand that how would you bring the awareness to uh, the people because you are directly dealing with customers which are the women. Yes, yes. Uh, we uh, launched a uh, website and you're all welcome to visit it. It's called thelovecurve.in. T H E L O V E C U R V E dot I N. And the Love Curve is an awareness and education website. Uh, it, it informs women why they should check themselves in the first place. What are the benefits of it and what are potential harms if you don't? Uh, when we speak with the National Health Mission offices of the government, we are not pitching that you buy X number of machines from us. Rather, we talk about a program called SEVA, which stands for Screening, Education, Wellness, and Awareness. And we are ensuring that we provide that program and not just a machine. Uh, so as to ensure that it's a comprehensive nature uh, approach which has been uh, internationally been recommended by multiple agencies including WHO IRC office, ICMR, ICPO which is India's prevention oncology uh, uh, advisory body and a, 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 an organization called Breast Health Global Initiative. So everybody knows that awareness and education is an important part of secondary prevention and, and we are quite aware of that fact as well. I think the admission to screening increases if there is awareness in that region. Uh, and we're, so we actually provide this uh, breast-shaped silicone models with tiny tumors hidden inside, and women in the waiting area play a little game of try and find this T 
tumor in this, this model breast, thereby gamifying the concept, taking the taboos away from it, but also educating them on how can you, how can you do self breast exam. So it, it, it's fundamentally a part of our approach. Okay, we have time for two more questions from the audience, and then Naran just told me he's got a hard question to throw at us. So, um, one in the front here. Yeah, uh, yeah. this is an open question. And one over there. This is an open question. Uh, in the previous uh, discussion that happened, uh, the founder of NextGen said that, you know, you can't play it both ways. You either are a for-profit company or you're a non-profit company or an organization. If you try to check both the boxes, you end up being good in neither, okay? This is something that she shared and he's uh, from a for-profit organization. My view is having worked in corporate for about 20 years and now having switched to non-profit over the last three years, I can clearly kind of see where this will take all these young people, successful people right now. As you scale, investors come in, they come with demands, they come with, you know, you have boards and you have policies and you have policies. You just can't work the way you were working right now, right? They are going to be pulling the string. So, how do you plan to address that? That's my first question, and a slightly uh, you know, related question. As you scale, isn't there a real danger that you are trying to fill a gap which actually the government should be in, uh, in the garbage? Most of the Western countries, through partnerships, through vendors, the government takes care of it. Hell, typically the government takes care of it with some private organization. Are we, because we are so successful, actually dissuading the government from actually doing its basic job. All right, so that could be actually an entire hour discussion to answer both those questions, which are excellent questions. Um, I'm going to try to get some short answers. I'm going to start with uh, Pavan thinking about the first one, which is, are you getting in the way of the government doing its job? Because, boy, it does a great job giving fresh, clean, safe water to people in India, doesn't it? So uh, tell me, how much are you getting the government's way? No, I don't think we are you know, taking away the government job. We, what we see ourselves is supplementing what the government is doing, you know, and taking it to the last step of making it clean, drinking water to the people. You know, if you see the human uh, daily requirement of drinking water is more than two to three liter. It's like 170 liter of water. So, you know, even when we are there, uh, we just take care of the drinking water requirement, or even we can add the cooking water requirement. But then there is still a, you know, the remaining, uh, you know, 150, 160 liter of water which you daily require, which is still the government needs to come in. And what I see is the like in the Indian scenario, you know, where uh, the drinking water is part of, you know, one of the activities which the local panchayat has to take care of. And if we just leave it to there, where there's a lot of uh, gap in the technical skills and all, uh, it would be, you know, it would be uh, rather negative in that sense, and uh, and won't justify fruit for that. So people like us, when they come up with an expertise, which a customized solution for drinking water, it actually helps the government activity. Great. And Dr. Anand is um, is trying to build a scalable for-profit venture getting in the way of you helping children become more healthy? Yeah, that's why I think I said in the beginning, it's about putting it into the DNA of the organization. I think that, you know, some of the things we talk about in terms of what you mentioned, will the board have a separate meeting around impact that has been created, things like that are not, we can't take it for granted because different type of investors may get on at different times. It's about us being, putting it into the DNA of the organization, what we are doing. Now, whatever form the organization takes, if it continues to remain in pediatric primary health care, I'm sure we are creating some impact. So that, that by itself, because of the nature of the space we are in, the kind of strategy that we have built to develop uh, and deliver programs is something that cannot be taken away from the company, right? We can change the business vision. Uh, I disagree when we say impact is only about the lower socioeconomic class. For example, is working on obesity in children in India, is it necessarily not impact? We are going to have great impact, but that means today obesity is largely in the middle and upper middle class. But it doesn't mean that if I work on obesity, I am not impact. So it's about building it into the DNA of the organization. And I think once that is done, things will take care by itself. Great. So last question in the front here. Yeah. Uh, tell you a uh, cost of you. See, basically, there's a uh, big uh, awareness coming out today that RO almost removes all the uh, good soils and the minerals which is uh, needed for the body to build up immunity and uh, bone strength. 
Now our world at TDS 10 and 15 is uh, now head of the big companies doing that. As well as enriched mineral. So you in older days your grandma and grandfather used to go and drink the rivulet water, they didn't fall sick. Today as because the immunity has become zero because of drinking RO water, past 10 years we are gone for a class, our immunity is gone for a zero. So today doctors have checked with a lot of doctors, they say nothing, uh, ill health has nothing to do with TDS. Can you answer this question? Because taking this far selling to the village doesn't connect, because RO itself is today debatable. Second thing, selling water in a village is not uh, for profit with the purpose. So, Pavan, it seems like we've struck a, a chord here. On, on, uh, so, could, could you give a really brief answer and then maybe you could uh, address the technical so points afterwards? Yeah, so this is a question most often asked. So, during the, you know, our grandfather's time and all, so the, you know, and before that, the water was not as polluted or the agriculture was not as intensive as, as today is, and the water which we get is contaminated most of the places. And, uh, you know, so we, it needs a, some sort of treatment, whether it's a chemical treatment or a biological treatment. So where we are speaking about is the TDS level, that, that, that means there is some amount of chemical contamination that is there in water. And it's not that, that you know, uh, you provide people with uh, uh, factory level or distilled water. Even in the system like RO, you can blend the water and provide them an accurate, you know, something like a TDS like 100 to 200. So there is a system built in in that. It's only about, you know, some of the private organizations, some, some bad apples creating, you know, a bad name for the whole sector itself. It's, you know, it's just, this is another technology where they can just blend the water and provide the correct uh, tedious levels in water. Great. And then, okay. thank you very much. So, I'm very pleased that we have a question from a lady from the final question. So, uh, please. Thank you. Um, uh, we actually don't call it antisocial here. <coughs> We call it the informal sector, as it's called in India. And in most of the places, whether you take Africa, India, anywhere, electronics is, is wealthy, it's a business, and it's a pretty mad business out there. And then the way you do it is defined by the fact that you've been doing it for many years, and suddenly you realize the way you're doing it is not right. So now you come up with a halo over your head and then say, boss, don't you stop doing this, we are the right guys to do it. I mean, that doesn't work, unfortunately. Now we have to kind of go down the path, and I actually wanted to do this at the end, but I just want to let people know here, all of us want to do, get into involve some recycling. We want it to be responsible, but we need first believe in responsible recycling before we actually get to the next step. Now, when we say responsible recycling, our intent, action, which means that you take less money from the next step, the Kabadi Wallace and everyone else, so that it actually lands up in a formal enterprise where it can be responsibly recycled. So if you want to wean people away from this anti-social or the informal sector, we have to first believe in responsible recycling. I mean, it goes, fact goes for both of us. I mean, whether you take Roshan or myself. Great, right. uh, let's go. I think we'll go to Ra So before we close this session, uh, close this session, I would like to ask Will, because Will was taking the privilege to ask questions to all. I would like to take this privilege to ask this question to Will. Uh, because he sees um, startups and uh, entrepreneurs across the world. So, can you list the three things, or all the panelists, if you could list the three things that these entrepreneurs should make sure, or they should consider while executing on the ground, executing on the ground, locally, that will take them globally. The three things. Yeah, well, I'll start by one, um, and I see this uh, in entrepreneurs <laughs> everywhere that we work. Um, and for me, it's mostly the United States and India, and the bulk in India, um, is if you want to be able to scale a business, you have to understand your fundamental unit economics. And it's remarkable how many entrepreneurs come to us with actually even functioning businesses that don't truly understand what it costs them to deliver a unit of product or service to their ultimate customer. And so if you want to scale locally, nationally, or globally, Understanding deeply what your unit economics are and what drives them um, is key. That, that's number one. Um, number two is you have to understand is the product or service you're building truly one that has a global market? So um, there may be some, uh, some businesses represented here that have unbelievably large global markets um, and other ones that um, you know, wouldn't necessarily fit very well globally uh, because the infrastructure is different or whatever. So I think. Uh, thinking very hard about um, the uh, dynamics of the national, regional, global markets and seeing how your business fits into them is key. And the final one comes to the first thing that I look into uh, every entrepreneur is do you have a team that can scale? 
And uh, we look, that's true whether you're doing intensely local business, uh, national or global, you have to have a team and the ability to show that you can build a team that can have that kind of scale and impact. And some teams have it and some don't. And some can get it and some can't. And so that's one thing that we're gonna always look for is does the leadership um, of a company have, show that they have the ability to build a team that can achieve truly uh, national and ultimately global scale. So those are the three things that I come up with. Anybody wanna add, uh, add something? So to the team uh, that was saying, a little bit of a nuance to it. Uh, it's just not the team that is working under you. It's also having one co-founder or somebody else who you can call as a peer who, we can, who shares your goals and visions and also can uh, help you bounce off ideas. And having two people or three people, I mean, I'm sure you know a lot of examples of Google and other places where there are multiple founders who have uh, who've grown the business to a bigger scale. I think having that person who we call as your equal and who can help you bounce off the ideas actually help you uh, build a better team. I'm glad you brought that up and just uh, on our particular sample of 22 companies that we have in our portfolio, uh, I'd say all but three of them have co-founders. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a super important uh, thing for success. So, Shiva. Uh, I think uh, from my perspective, uh, I think leadership is very important, though it's, it's the team is uh, definitely also a function of leadership. Uh, I think social enterprises are difficult, you're solving some really difficult problems and uh, there'll be a lot of failures uh, and sometimes uh, it's not really a failure but it'll take a lot of time to see uh, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. So the leadership is very important, the management team and the founder or the co-founders should have the perseverance and the leadership in the face of failure or in the face of like you know where you are really stuck in the dark uh, to stand up and smile and say come on guys let's do one more round. So I think that kind of leadership is very important to make uh, startups, especially social enterprises work. And in the spirit of having the last question from a lady from the audience, how about if the last answer comes from a uh, lady on the panel? So thought that you have a comment on what it takes to, uh, what, what you would think about it was required to scale globally ultimately. See, in our program, possibly some, it's more the local, having a local talent available, because we, as far as I said, we don't seek to replace the teacher in the classroom. So the teacher or the adult or the facilitator, whatever you would call, needs to be present for children to facilitate them and to encourage them to give them a, a pat on the shoulder when they do well. So for us, getting that local team is very, very important. So though we have, in, though we can, the products can be used anywhere in the world, having a local team really helps. Great, thanks. Great.